and it, which is known as JATA. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Okada, from JATA to give the award. Thank you very much, Polna. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, it is my great honor and privilege to be here today at this ceremony to give the Princess Chichibu Memorial TV Global Award on behalf of the, Her Imperial Highness Princess Akishino, Patroness of Japan and Teacher Box Association. This award has been given every year since 1998 by Japan Anti Association in collaboration with the Union at the World Conference on Lung Health in recognition of the distinguished achievement to international anti activities. I would like to briefly introduce the background of this award. The late Princess Chichibu had been the patroness of JATA uh, from its foundation in 1939. Shortly after she had started to serve as patroness, her husband, Prince Chichibu, a, for, a brother of Emperor Showa, suffered from tuberculosis and passed away after uh, more than 10 years of struggling. Upon this sad experience, Princess Chichibu further devoted herself throughout her life to the prevention of tuberculosis. This award was initiated based on her wishes to make the world free from TB. The winner of this award for 2019 is Dr. Amina Jindani, Honorary Senior Lecturer, Institute for Infection and Immunity, Division of Clinical Sciences, St. George's, University of London. She is one of the famous, well-known researchers in the tuberculosis field and a global leader of TB treatment and drug de development. She has been involved in many researches, many uh, seminal key uh, trials, including the short course TB regimen, as we know it today, eight month regimens for a newly diagnosed TB in, landa in a randomized control trial, and high dose repenting for pulmonary TB. Her works were published in the Lancet, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and other highly ranked uh, medical journals. Thus, her work has contributed to a policy document of a number of international agencies, including WHO. She now continues her international multicenter researches to shorten the treatment duration for paranoid TB, which leads to reduce TB transmission and eventually to eliminate TB in the world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, on behalf of JATA and the Union, would like to invite Dr. Jindani to receive the award for her outstanding contribution to global TB control and prevention. Dr. Jinani, would you please come forward to accept this year's award? Congratulations. Good morning, everybody, and I would like to express my deep gratitude to the Japan Anti-Tuberculosis Association for this recognition of my work in tuberculosis elimination. Um, there, 
to keep it brief, there are many, many people have supported me on my career to this point, but there are two sets of gratitude I would like to express. The first is to my parents, who gave me the best education a Muslim girl of my time could have received. The second is the late Denny Mitchison, who for many years guided my career to this point, and I'm really sorry that he is not here to receive, see me receive this prize. And lastly, again, I thank Jata for the recognition of this work. We still have a long way to go, but I'm still on the case. Thank you. So hello, good morning. Welcome to the plenary one of this 50th Union Conference on Tuberculosis and Lung Health. My name is Alberto Garcia Basteiro, and I'm an epidemiologist working at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health and the Manisa Health Research Center in Mozambique. This plenary is titled Ending the TB Emergency. We have a great panel of uh, speakers who are gonna talk about uh, two different um, important phases or stages in the life of someone with tuberculosis, that is latent TB infection and also a, a post-TB treatment. So they will address the challenges and the strategies uh, uh, involved in um, addressing the uh, uh, latent TB uh, reservoir and those associated with TB treatment optimization in order to prevent TB sequelae. We will also have the privilege to hear the perspective and the testimony of a XDR TB survivor. Uh, we will have some questions, hopefully at the end, five minutes, so we'll do the first the, uh, first, the three presentations. So without further preambles, allow me to introduce uh, Jason Andrews. Jason Andrews is a physician and assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Geographic Medicine at Stanford University. His research focuses on understanding tuberculosis transmission and identifying effective approaches for its control using a combination of uh, field epidemiology studies, clinical translational research, and also mathematical modeling. So Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to share my perspectives on how we might address the MTB infection reservoir. As an overview, I'm going to be talking about the size and scope of the infection reservoir, our historical approaches, and current challenges with facing it. Um, then we'll turn to some emerging tools that we have that might help us more effectively address the reservoir, um, knowledge gaps that remain, and then finally some opportunities to achieve progress. Just beginning with conflicts of interest, we'd like to acknowledge um, grant support from the U US NIH as well as the Gates Foundation for Research. And I'd like to just start with our current outlook and challenges and paradigm in addressing the reservoir and begin with our very basic model of um, TB natural history uh, transmission and epidemiology, which is that we have a large pool of infected individuals who face a risk of progression to TB disease, and individuals with TB disease transmit to others, renewing that infectious pool or reservoir. And this basic model has guided our interventions um, on blocking both sides of the, both pathways here. First, blocking transmission through early case detection and treatment, and more recently, perhaps through vaccines that prevent infection and then blocking progression among individuals who are already infected with TB through preventive therapy, or perhaps, as we've seen recently, vaccines that might prevent progression. 
And we have historical evidence for how this can be highly effective in reducing TB incidence and TB transmission. Um, I, I look here to the famous studies of George Comstock and colleagues that were conducted in Alaska, where intensified case detection and treatment led to a marked decline in TB infection rates in an area with one of the highest TB incidences in the world back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in Alaska. And what they achieved, as shown in the figure here, was a reduction in the annual risk of infection from 24% per year down to 1% per year in just a decade, one of the most extraordinary examples of what sustained TB control efforts can do in a short period of time. So that's blocking transmission. We've also seen um, the effectiveness that, that can be achieved through community-wide efforts to prevent disease progression. Similarly, studies done by Comstock and colleagues uh, in Bethel, Alaska, where individuals were randomized to isoniazid or placebo, and we saw a marked reduction in TB incidence rates in those that received isoniazid um, that was sustained. So we do have examples for blocking both pathways historically. Nevertheless, 60 years later, we're still faced with a very large number of individuals who are infected. Ryan Hubin and Pete Dodd recently estimated that 1.7 billion individuals worldwide are infected or have been infected at some point with the highest rates in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Recently, however, this concept of a very large infectious pool that is infected pool that is at risk of disease progression has come into question. And I, I cite here a, a provocative and thoughtful um, piece by Marcel Baer and colleagues that was published in BMJ last year about revisiting the timetable of tuberculosis and looking at historical studies that followed individuals post-infection, um, noted that more than 90%, in many cases more than 95% of disease that would occur, occurs within the two, two years following infection, suggesting that we really need to be thinking about this shorter time window um, following infection. And Marcel and colleagues followed this on with, a, with another interesting um, perspective that just came out within the past couple of weeks, again in BMJ, um, questioning whether M. tuberculosis infection is indeed lifelong and pointing towards both historical as well as contemporary evidence that we may be able to sterilize infections immunologically um, and that in fact having lifelong infection may be the exception rather than the rule. And this has led to a lot of debate about the term latent infection, or latent tuberculosis, and whether or not we indeed have this large pool of 25% of the world's population that harbors MTB infection is at risk of, of progression. Regardless of the debate, it is very clear that there is a smaller subset of individuals who have been infected who are at highest risk of progression, and th these are the individuals that we should prioritize for our prevent prevention efforts. Um, Ryan and Pete in their um, global estimates of LTBI infection did try to calculate what this high-risk reservoir, high-risk pool may look like and found that 56 million people um, had been infected within the past two years, so a much smaller group of individuals who are at the very high risk of disease progression and should be targeted for prevention. And this more or less comports with the recent WHO guidance, um, which was released last year that identifies priority groups for preventive therapy and focuses on those individuals who have been recently infected or who are immunocompromised and would benefit most from preventive therapy. And there's three, three basic groups that have been identified. So HIV-infected HIV children and adults, children under five who are household contacts of pulmonary TB cases, and then individuals of all ages who are household contacts in low incidence settings are strongly recommended to receive preventive therapy or in high incidence settings as a conditional recommendation. At the UN high level meeting last year, member states committed to providing um, 30, million, 30 million people preventive therapy over the, the next five years. So let's see what kind of progress we've been achieving in recent years in provision of preventive therapy to these targeted high risk groups. First starting with people living with HIV. We've seen actually quite remarkable progress and uptick in 
the proportion of individuals with HIV who have been receiving preventive therapy. This is a figure from the recent WHO Global Report. And you can see that South Africa have really led the way um, historically, but in recent years we've seen a global up uptick more broadly, such that in 2018, 49% of individuals enrolled in HIV care are receiving preventive therapy. So we are making progress in people living with HIV, but still have a ways to go. In children who are household contacts of TB cases, we are also seeing some progress, but we're much further away from reaching our target. So there's a target of 1.3 million children um, who are household contacts who should be provided preventive therapy. And right now we are reaching about 27% of those children. Among household contacts over the age of five, this is where the largest gap exists and probably where the largest um, number of individuals exist who would benefit from preventive therapy. We don't have great estimates on the proportion receiving preventive therapy nor on the target um, population, um, but it's in, in the um, UN commitments, it's four million individuals per year over the next five years that would need preventive therapy. And we are currently really reaching 2% as of 2018. So this is where our large implementation gap exists. We might also ask whether household contact investigations are going to be enough to address this reservoir. This is some recent work from Leo Martinez in our group um, who, who looked at a number of st studies, both molecular epidemiologic as well as cohort and cross-sectional studies, to try to estimate the proportion of infections that are acquired within the household versus outside the households. And even in among children, young children, whom we believe have the highest risk within households, the highest proportion within households, only about 10 to 30 percent of those infections occur in the household. And the flip side of that is that 70 to 90 percent of infections in young children, and perhaps even higher among adults, occur outside the household, and then therefore would not be preventable by household contact investigation-based preventive therapies. And furthermore, even when we conduct household contact investigations, often it's too late. This is more work from Leo showing that um, in household contacts under the age of five, the majority of cases are already co-prevalent at the time of the contact investigation. 83% were diagnosed within 90 days, and among those who were TST or IGRA positive, it was 96%. So the window for reaching children in order to prevent disease is quite narrow. This is not to say that household contact investigations are not effective, nor that they should not be pursued. We have good evidence, including, as I cite here, a recent randomized trial by Greg Fox and colleagues showing that household contact investigations can be an efficient way to, to improve TB diagnoses, um, and they saw a, a substantial effect in this randomized trial um, on case detection. I believe that they should be implemented everywhere, regardless of these earlier challenge, but I think we should acknowledge that even if we fully implement contact investigations and we have a long way to go towards that, it would fail to prevent the majority of TB cases and would be an insufficient population-based strategy to address the infection reservoir. So let's turn towards some new tools that may help us do better. First, one of the challenges that we have um, with community-wide strategies for prevention is that we don't have great tools for identifying who is at highest risk of progression. Tuberculin skin tests and IGRAs have a very low positive predictive value when done across the population, typically on the order of 1 or 2%. But we have increasingly recognized that there is a broader spectrum of TB infection states and that there may be in value in targeting individuals who are at the highest risk of progression, um, those who have been termed, for example, incipient tuberculosis. And we may have some new tools that may help us identify that group. There, there's been a lot of interest in host gene expression signatures and evidence that these signatures can identify individuals who are going to progress up to 18 months before their diagnosis, suggesting that we would have um, a better positive predictive value for finding individuals who should receive preventive therapy. This is now being evaluated in a community-based trial, the CORTIS trial, and we are awaiting results of this to see whether this could be an, a novel strategy. The next tool we have are short course preventive therapy regimens. We have increasing evidence about the effectiveness as well as the safety of short rifamycin-containing regimens, including 3-HP, um, three to four months of isoniazid and rifampicin or daily rifampicin. 
We also have most recently evidence for uh, one HP or a month of isoniazid and rifapintine among HIV infected individuals as being non inferior to nine months of isoniazid for prevention of HIV related tuberculosis. Advantages of these regimens is that they have comparable efficacy, lower toxicities, and higher treatment completion rates. But a major obstacle to scaling these up is the high cost right now of rifapintine, and efforts are underway to address this. Some of the most exciting results that we have for addressing the reservoir and preventing disease are in the new vaccines and the vaccine trials that have been recently released. So the M72 um, vaccine trial final analysis was published earlier this week in the New England Journal, and the results were presented at TB Science and showed a 50% reduction in disease among individuals with a positive IGRA. We also have some evidence about repurposing of old tools. Um, BCG revaccination in a randomized trial also published last year showed a 45% reduction in sustained IGRA conversion, and this may be a new way to prevent um, the growth of the infectious reservoir. So I'm going to shift now to knowledge gaps. There are several things that we need to know to more effectively address the entire infectious reservoir, including among MDR-exposed contacts. It's estimated that 19 million individuals globally are infected or have been infected with multidrug-resistant strains. To date, we have not had randomized trial evidence for the effectiveness of preventive therapy regimens, though we have an abundance of observational studies which have suggested that there is a substantial reduction in disease with various regimens. There are three RCTs underway that are looking at levofloxacin and delaminid, and we're awaiting these results. It's important to acknowledge also that many MDR TB household contacts develop drug susceptible TB. So we need to actually have universal regimens that will be highly effective against both susceptible as well as multidrug resistant TB. The next issue, and this has been really a major obstacle towards implementation in high burden settings, is how we contend with reinfection. We know from randomized trials of isoniazid conducted in Botswana and South Africa that after stopping um, isoniazid after six months, there is a rapid rebound in disease rates, presumably due to reinfection. By contrast, in Brazil, which has a much lower TB incidence, the effectiveness of isoniazid was sustained for years after individuals received a short course isoniazid preventive therapy. And what's clear from this is that in high transmission settings, we will either need to do much longer durations of preventive therapy or potentially, intriguingly, intermittent preventive therapy. And one randomized trial for preventive um, therapy, I believe, has been completed, and we're awaiting the results of this as another strategy for sustained prevention. And it's important, of course, to remember that preventive therapy, particularly in high transmission settings, must be conducted along other side, along other, alongside other effective prevention measures in order to prevent reinfection. So how do we take this all to scale? We have evidence for what may work in rural Alaska in the 1950s and 1960s, but that setting looks quite different for where, from where the TB epidemic is today, which, which are in large, densely populated, and highly connected cities. We need models for how to effectively address the infectious reservoir drive down TB disease and infection rates in these settings. A number of groups are looking to create and test these models, and I just note here the Zero TB movement, which seeks to create islands of elimination in high burden cities, including Dhaka, Chennai, Karachi, and Lima. And we eagerly await the results of their studies. So to conclude, addressing the global MTB infection reservoir requires preventing new infections and preventing disease progression among those already infected, to drain the reservoir and prevent it from growing. We have tended to view these as competing priorities, pitting treatment against prevention, much in the same way the HIV community wrestled with this issue of treatment versus prevention, when really these are advancing the same cause and are complementary. We're at a moment of opportunity to expand our efforts we have new global commitments to finance preventive therapy, expanded WHO recommendations on treatment of LTBI, emerging tools to identify those at highest risk of progression, which may enable community-wide prevention efforts, and finally, short course regimens that may improve our treatment completion rates. 
And lastly, we need successful models now to bring TB prevention to scale. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for that excellent presentation. Let's go, let's move to the, to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Stella Ampagama. She works at the Kibongoto Infectious Diseases Hospital in Tanzania. She's a physician and a senior fellow of the EDCTP, the European and Developing, Developing Countries Clinical Trial uh, Partnership. Um, Dr. Uh, Mpagama uh, works uh, in trying to find solutions for both programmatic and clinical challenges of infectious diseases with a focus on tuberculosis. She's very much interested in the intersection between communicable and non-communicable uh, diseases. Uh, her research has focused also on uh, the interplay between tuberculosis and diabetes, and uh, in the um, understanding of the post-TB sequelae, such as bronchiectasis and other chronic respiratory lung diseases. So, Stella. Good morning. Uh, I will talk on optimizing the treatment to maximize health and well-being uh, after TB. And this talk maps on the uh, Union Five Years uh, Strategic Plan on Lung Health. And I will touch on the general health and the well-being, uh, mental health, socioeconomic, uh, as well as stigma and the discrimination. I declare that I, I, I don't have a conflict of interest uh, pertaining to, to what I will present. So uh, we are all aware that tuberculosis has a considerable effect on individuals' quality of life, which have shown to persist despite completing tuberculosis and achieving microbial cure. Uh, in the past decade, we have been treating tuberculosis, largely focusing on microbial elimination without considering other aspect of health and the well-being after TB. Uh, the World Health Organization reports that from 2000 to 2018, around 54 million people have been cured for tuberculosis. And research studies have shown that half of the population uh, cured for tuberculosis usually develops post-TB lung illness. And for those with post-TB lung illness, half of it have severe form of disease. In such a way, mortality is very high within the first uh, 10 years. So this is a neglected phase of life after tuberculosis. And the post-TB uh, lung disease, it's not a single entity, it's not a single uh, disease. It's presented heterogeneous, and this is largely due to variations in the host immune response. We see some of the uh, individuals present with the obstructive features, uh, such as a decrease of F FEV1, and the others present with restrictive uh, clinical presentations. And in this population, which is presenting with restrictive, they usually have either a decreased FVC or uh, increase of a ratio of FEV1 and FVC. And uh, the uh, patients with the uh, post-TB lung disease, adults, they usually tend to present with a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, while in children, it, it presents as a bronchioptasis. And also we see a population which is uh, presenting with fibrosis, and the complicated into pulmonary hypertension. And also in a considerable population, we see uh, they have mixed disease, meaning that both are features of obstruction and restrictive as well. And uh, there is a bacterial superinfection, such as non-tuberculous mycobacterium, as well as fungal, uh, such as aspergillosis. 
So despite of having this high burden, there is a limited scientific evidence to guide you on how to manage this uh, condition. Almost none of the research studies have assessed on the management of positive lung disease. Uh, this year in July, we had the first international post-TB symposium in Stellenbosch, South Africa. And uh, participants were from almost of the continent, and uh, we uh, discussed on the epidemiology, trying to see uh, the available literature on epidemiology mechanisms of uh, post-TB lung disease, uh, issues related to host-directed therapies, treatment and uh, holistic management, as well as recurrent TB. Generally, uh, we had more research questions than a solution. Uh, in, uh, the, 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 it was noted that we really need new science to uh, guide us to take new action for addressing uh, the, the challenges after TB treatment. Now, for the new science, uh, we see that there are opportunities which can be uh, available to prevent the development of post-TB lung disease during TB treatment. In that way, we can prevent uh, post-TB lung disease, but also for the population which has already developed post-TB lung disease, uh, we need uh, new sciences and good approaches to manage the post-TB diseases so that we can minimize human suffering. For the prevention, there are several adjunctive therapies which have shown probably they can reduce lung damage, but there are a lot of uncertainties around those options. For example, steroids. Uh, there is one uh, meta-regression study uh, conducted by Wallace and colleagues. They showed that uh, prednisolone at the dose of 134 milligram once daily for one to two months can prevent development of post-TB lung disease. But if that, that dose is too high, in such a way, uh, the cardiometabolic consequences are not clear, and I'm sure no one who will dare to give that high dose. Uh, two manic rushes factor alpha blockers, there is limited evidence. Doxycycline, it's an antibiotic, but it has shown to, uh, to, um, to inhibit metalloproteinases, so it has anticholinogenolytic effect but there is little clinical evidence on this. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as ibuprofen, has been tested, but uh, evidence is, is, is not adequate to guide uh, police action. We have metformin. Uh, this is usually attenuate pulmonary inflammation, but findings are contradicting. Uh, also, vitamin D3 results are ambiguous. Uh, statins show that it might be a potential uh, drug to prevent positive lung disease, but there is no evidence for human, only mice studies are available. Interferon gamma as well, the findings are contradicting. Animal and the human findings, they are, they, they, they are not matching. And also we have the mesenchymal stromal cells, which have shown some promise. They've been used to treat a few number of MDRTB patients because it has shown, it has, um, strong immunomodulatory effect, but again, evidence is not adequate. Yeah, so we see uh, there is opportunities, but then um, there is no evidence which can guide on how to prevent positive lung disease development. Uh, research on the mechanisms, uh, it, we, we really need to understand clearly the precise mechanism on how this positive lung disease develop because if we have uh, learned that there is a group which can, half of, of the uh, population may be normal, half may have uh, positive lung disease, but again, the pattern is not the same. Uh, this shows that the host immune uh, is responsible for lung damage and excessive inflammation, but exactly how, it is not clear. Again, um, we are not sure if TB pathogen, as you know, MTBC complex, it has several lineages and strains. We, we don't know which strain um, has influence in causing positive lung diseases. So these are 
some of the research questions which probably they need to be addressed. But yeah, it is clearly that variations in human genes modulate the response and determine as well as the severity of lung impairment. But again, in, in, in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa, the mechanism may be also influenced uh, by the exposure to external factors such as biomass exposure, HIV co-infection, as well as malnutrition. And we don't know how these uh, external in, uh, exposures in the core morbidities may affect the uh, development and the, presentation and, the, and the presentation of the post-TB lung disease. Yeah, um, research on treatment, we have the pharmacotherapies as well as non-pharmacological approaches. Uh, we have seen there is a group of post-TB lung disease may develop uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but there is a clear guideline on how to manage COPD. Though within the African health system, this, this is not done. Uh, it's not done programmatically. So uh, we, we, we are also not clear, and we really need to know the effectiveness of the COPD management in the TB-associated COPD. We need to know the effectiveness of the treatment if we were just to um, take the COPD uh, management and uh, just translate directly to TB related. We need to know effectiveness, affordability, as well as the availability of those pharmacological treatment. But again, um, in, when we are treating TB, it, it is very clear on the decision points. We usually monitor, catch us, mirror, and we know when to say this one has failed the treatment, this one has not. But when you talk about managing post-TB lung disease, uh, we don't have a clear methodology which can uh, be adapted in the health system. If we were to administer pulmonary rehabilitation, we don't know how frequently, because that, all those points have implication in the health system. Uh, we don't have a guideline as well to guide on how to manage. The pulmonary rehabilitation, there are uh, some media data from Uganda. They've shown that probably it can have some effect in terms of morbidity and mortality. And in this population, uh, they have accelerated, uh, they, they, have, they are anxious as well as they are depressed. So uh, there is little evidence to, to, to see uh, the effect of pulmonary rehabilitation on these morbidities and mortality. Yeah, uh, people with the TB, they, they have a risk, people who have already treated TB, they have a risk of developing recurrent TB uh, around 10%, especially in, in, in endemic areas. And this is one of the important uh, risk factor for progressing to positive lung disease. Unfortunately, treatment outcomes in this population is, 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 is not good. But again, in, in a TB endemic settings, it seems reinfection is common than relapse. So uh, we think if there is any option to prevent development of recurrent TB, we'll maximize health and the well-being of this population. Uh, coming to the mental health and the well-being after TB, uh, we are saying that literal is known on the, on the burden of this uh, problem, mental health. But again, during the tuberculosis phase, there is clear evidence that uh, most of the TB patients have mental illness, like, uh, presenting with a generalized anxiety disorder, adjustment disorder, as well as depressive disorder. Though in, in a resource-limited setting, this is rarely considered during TB treatment. So we even don't know what happens after TB treatment. Studies have shown that prevalence of depression in TB is around threefold compared to other non-severe illnesses. And the prevalence ranges 40 to 80%. There is biological plausibility on this. And it seems uh, 
the uh, TB, it's a chronic inflammatory, uh, it, it, it evokes the, the, the chronic pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-2, interleukin-6, uh, C-reactive proteins as well as acute phase proteins. All those have effect in neurotransmission and that triggers depression. But again, there is a dysregulation of hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, which also eventually ends to depression. So there is a vicious cycle between TB and the tuberculosis, and it seems TB uh, depression is, is very syndemic. But again, with the external factors such as social stigmatization and financial situation, we don't know how it complicates or worsens the situation. Again, there is a comorbidities like malnutrition, HIV, and diabetes. But again, there are some of the drugs, anti-TB drugs, such as isoniazid and cyproserine. They have uh, adverse uh, reactions in the mental status. And persistent depression, persistent mental, mental disease, like anxiety, sometimes may present with the somatic symptoms. And they may find a patient presenting with a shortness of breath or sweating. And they, we may say that probably this is a relapse, but it's an undiagnosed mental uh, disorder. For, the, for the patients who are with the TB ending with the COPD, just to link, COPD shows that the, the mental disorder is around 10 to 90%, and they present with the, the same general anxiety adjustment and depressive. Now, we are not clear with the propor uh, proportion of the patients who have persisted with a positive lung uh, disease after treatment. So I, it is very important to understand the burden of mental illness in a uh, positive lung, indiv individuals suffering from positive lung disease, but also to understand uh, what will be the appropriate management in, in that group. And in this way, we need to collaborate uh, TB care providers and psychiatrists or psychotherapists need to work together because some patients may need psychotherapy, others may need psychotherapeutics drugs. So these are the areas where we really need new science for guiding new action. Stigma and the discrimination. Uh, stigma is defined as a dynamic process of devaluation that eventually discredit an individual in the eyes of others. But when stigma is en enacted, that, that uh, discrimination eventually occurs. And research studies on stigma and the TB have shown that uh, patients usually have diminished social capital, damage of social reputation, prospect for employment, education, and marriage, they are all in trouble. But again, this has a negative consequence because it has shown to destroy patients' resilience to treatment. There is excellent framework this, uh, on, uh, describing on how to deal with the stigma and the TB. But little is known uh, uh, persistence of stigma after TB treatment. So we really need to understand, extend uh, this kind of frameworks to see if there is any effect after TB treatment. And they declare that microbiologically, someone is keyword. On the socioeconomic effect and the well-being, there is adequate evidence that TB is a disease of poverty and there is uh, associated with the socioeconomic challenges, such as poor nutrition, lack of education, low income, overcrowding and employment, homelessness, quality of indoor air. But we don't know how, uh, if these factors have any effect after TB, as well as the mitigation strategies. So we really need to advocate on how to maximize health and the well-being after TB cure. Uh, we need a, a collaboration of researchers, healthcare providers, policymakers, communities to, to, to deal with all these challenges which have been highlighted. Just to reiterate that um, this talk uh, reflect on the five-year um, uh, on the Union five-year strategic plan on lung health. Thank you very much.
So thank you, Stella, for that comprehensive overview of uh, the challenges of post-TB treatment. So now we uh, move to the third presentation um, that is going to be delivered by Manasi Kade. She's a, a civil society a representative and a TB survivor. She was 19 years old when she was diagnosed of uh, tuberculosis. Um, she's from Mumbai here in, in India. And she was one of the lucky ones receiving Bedaquilin when very few people had access to Bedaquilin and it was recommended only for compassionate use. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts and your perspectives. Welcome to the podium. Hello, um, my name is Mansi and I'm an XTRTV survivor. So I'll take this in a candid way because the, like, um, so these guys tell you about the, what is happening, uh, what are the measures that have been taken, and every other, I uh, would like to say, um, oh God, I'm nervous. Um. <laughs> so, about me. Uh, I was in college, I was 19 year old, was about to be in the second year, and you know that is the time when you are thinking about your career, uh, your education, and every single every single thing you have to do when you're a like proper teenager. You're about to be a 20 year old, and uh, you have dreams, and it's it's like you're about to be happy. It's gonna be your life. You're gonna do it, and suddenly you get a message that oh my God, you have uh, XDR TV. So. That is heartbreaking, especially for a 19-year-old who's been, uh, who has seen uh, what is TB. Because my dad also uh, was diagnosed with MDR-TB. And um, as soon as he completed his treatment, he got cured. Like, after two, three months, I was diagnosed with XDR-TB directly. Um, so, this is my story. <laughs> So I would like to speak about uh, the post -treat treatment and uh, the mental health, especially the mental health, about uh, when you're going through a treatment. First thing, I've noticed that um, people don't really think about mental health, like not at all. So the first thing that comes to everybody's mind when you get a TB, uh, talking about a social issue here. So as soon as I came to know, I got XDR TV. The first thing I've received is don't tell anyone about it. Um, why? Why shouldn't I? Uh, it is necessary because then I won't be spreading it to other people. And um, it's the second thing I've received uh, was who will marry you? Uh, like I was going through an XDR TV. Is that really important that somebody's gonna marry me is the more, it's not a big issue for me right now. That is not a major issue for me. For me, it was like, get cured, be happy, get back to your normal life. Um, so while going through the treatment, you get isolated. And this isolation is so, so bad. Like, uh, imagine, I was in my house. I was staying in my house. I have a very small house. And I locked myself into a room. I locked myself into a room. I didn't let my mom meet me for six months. Like, I was in a room. The only thing I would, the only like, time I would open a room was just to eat food, take medicines, and uh, like, th these are the only way I, was op I used to open my room. So, uh, knowing my mom is crying, like, right next to me, outside the door, is, is really, really heartbreaking, not just my mom. So. It's not just when you get a TV, it's not just about you. It's about the whole family. The whole family has to go through it. It's not just you. And people need support. Family needs to, needs to support the person because uh, recently uh, there was a news in a local newspaper that a 31 year old committed suicide because of isolation from hospital. He jumped off from a five story building in, in the hospital. He jumped off from the hospital uh, and committed suicide. Why is this happening? Like, he literally had no, like, 
not a single family member was visiting him. Why is this happening? It is not something we have taken, like, we have got, like, we have taken it from ourselves. It's, it is, it's not our mistake. We don't take tuberculosis, it's like, uh, what should I say? Um, it's not really into our hands that we get tuberculosis. And especially also nutrition. We talk about nu nutrition, that we get lack of nutrition. We don't have uh, uh, enough, like, proper medicines for, like, not just proper medicines, like, um, especially, let's speak about the nutrition first. So people say that you have to eat food. You have to do, take medicines on time. You have to do everything on time. It will be cured and it will be fine. It's not that easy. When you are the earning person in the family and you got tuberculosis, you cannot earn anymore. Your financial status is bad. You, you have nothing in your hand. And you have to feed your family as well. So the first priority for the person who would be earning in the family would be not the medicine, would be getting food properly. And okay. So we need lesser treatment or so. Oh God, I'm so sorry. This is my first time doing this. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, the thing about nutrition, as, uh, it's not just like one person is suffering from it, the whole family suffers, so food is important, I know, but some people cannot afford it, literally. And then the medicines. Medicines are very, very expensive. Even if you think about getting a normal treatment, you have to spend at least uh, 10,000 uh, Indian rupees for at least a month for just on the medicines. Some people have a salary of 10,000. How they're gonna afford to medicine? They cannot, they cannot. And uh, so these are, the, these are also things that go, like, make people get, go into depression. Because uh, the first thing you see, your life is getting messed up, like completely. Your family, your friends are sometimes running away from you. You're being isolated. You have no one to talk to. Sometimes uh, at, a, at a point you feel like committing suicide. Like I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this. It's, it's better to die than go through all the treatment. Uh, so while taking medicines, uh, we have injections. We have to take at least 15 to 20 pills a day, minimum sometimes, minimums. And in even injection every single day for at least for six months. Is it really easy to take six, uh, injection every single day for six months? No, it's not. You cannot sit properly. You cannot go out. You cannot do anything. Also, the medicines are heavy, are really, really heavy. The NG, like, I, I used to take around um, f seven to eight medicines a day, like, per time, and it's, it used to fluctuate according to the treatment. And at a point, I used to feel dizzy, and I used to, like, fall down, literally fall down of my, like, I was sitting, and I'm f uh, falling off my chair. Because these are so heavy, you feel dizzy. Uh, you don't have, like, you're exhausted completely. You have no life left into you. Uh, at a point, my brother used to carry me to the washroom. This is something we have to go through, and this is something nobody wants to go through, to be honest, because you're very happy and healthy, and out of nowhere, like in three to four months, you are at the situation you cannot walk at all. Uh, okay, this is about the medicines and the uh, side effects while going through TB treatment. Now, but after treatment, the post-TB treatment, uh, are there really, like, I would really like to know that there are a proper post-TB treatment because there are few people I know in my family and my friends, they have such a severe effects of TB uh, medicines, especially my dad, he, he, ha he has lost his left vision. Like, he cannot see from his left eye at all. My friends have uh, hearing problems. They cannot, uh, at this point, uh, even I had a problem, I cannot run. 
I cannot dance. I cannot do anything which I used to love. I used to love drinking, but I'm, I've been told that I shouldn't be doing it. Why is this happening? We need, we need to address this. Uh, so after getting my treatment done, after getting everything done, I was like, OK, let's go back to normal life, be happy again, and you know, everything would be fine. It wasn't that fine. It wasn't really fine. I saw people running away from me, literally saw me change the route. Uh, even my family uh, stopped coming into my house. Like They completely ignored, uh, so especially Diwali's. It's Diwali season, Diwali right now. Uh, there are many relatives coming in, going out. Like They used to visit your family. They don't do it anymore with my family. And it's been um, almost two years that I've been cured. Still, I face this stigma. Um, also, there are a few issues, not just issues, um, I would like to address is after treatment, I, like, I would really like to know with that is it really a treatment um, after getting a post-treatment? Is it really a treatment available? Because we need it desperately. I would really like to know if there's a treatment right now because I know people who are going through it and they are really suffering. Even uh, So my dad has been cured for three years now. He's still going through it. He cannot walk. He has to have someone with him while walking. Uh, he cannot see. He cannot do anything. It's like. Sometimes I do have a chat with my family, and he literally tells me, I, would, I wish I would have died. I, I cannot hear. Like, this is not something I want to hear from my dad. I was really lucky that I didn't receive that many um, uh, severe problems after, like, after post-treatment. But it's, it's a, sometimes it still hurts you. Can, uh, even if the uh, treatment is done, you are completely fine. People still see you as a TB patient. They don't see you as a normal human anymore. So the thing, I've been known, like everybody talks about me. It's always about I'm a TB patient, I'm an XDR TB survivor. And uh, this is what has been my identity now. Not just a normal human. Like, hi, this is my, she's a TB survivor. Why am I not a normal human? I've always been, like everybody sees me as a patient, they sympathize me. But OK, you do it. But then make us feel normal again. We want to feel normal again. Don't just look at us, oh my god, patient, she went through so much. Like even, uh, it's funny because I'm completely normal now. And still people look at me like, can you walk? I'm like, I just walked in front of you. Why? Why are you still looking at me like this? Are you, like every single time, if I'm trying to, like. If I'm traveling and people know if I'm going to TV, like, oh my God, you, just, you have to sit first. You don't stand. Why? Look at us as the normal people. Please make us included like every single person I know. So, is there any questions? You like? <laughs> No questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Manasi, for your... I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but, um, but um, thank you for that uh, powerful testimony and for, and for showing us uh, and sharing with us some of the challenges uh, during TB treatment, but also after, after uh, TB treatment. Um, we have, we are running out of time. We'll have time for perhaps two questions. So if there are any questions, now is the time. We have four microphones at the both sides of the, of the um, hall of the room. Please go ahead. Hi. If you can say your name and, and where you come from. Uh, Hi, Kevin Mortimer. So I'm the director of lung health for the uh, union. We've recently developed a strategy for the department. A major theme is the um, health and well-being of the TB. So um, really delighted by the last uh, to, to hear the insights. And thank you so much for your bravery in uh, 
Um, really, really Im impressive. And I guess my question is, if, is there one th if there was one thing that we could do as the union within that uh, programme of work on health and wellbeing after TB, how would you advise us? TB program, I would like to say that um, the treatment really is really long right now, and uh, especially the medicines and the injection part I told you. I went through the treatment for two and a half years, and the side effects of it affected me for more than six months after that. So I would really like to make a treatment shorter, I guess, and less side effects, please. <laughs> Thank you. So we have two more questions. We cannot take more. So uh, please, in the microphone in the back, I think it was first. Uh, I'm Anurag Bhargav from India. Um, I enjoyed the talk by Dr. Jason Andrews, but India has 3 million cases of TB every year and a reservoir of about 500 million with putative infection. So what you described as the challenges and the caveats really leads us to an uncharted territory in India. If we are even contemplating an IPT-based treatment prevention, uh, TB prevention strategy. So I feel that it has to be complemented by other public health interventions which address the risk factors for TB in the community at large. And there are historical examples apart from the Comstock example. In Papua, the annual risk of TB infection was exactly the same, 24% a year. And social interventions, including adequate nutrition, prevented a, a TB incidence by, reduced TB by 84%. So I think IPT forms one part of an overall strategy which has to include other public health interventions. Yeah, thank you very much for that comment. I couldn't agree more. Um, if I had more time, I would have liked to have talked about non-biomedical-based interventions because we, of course, have seen dramatic declines in TB disease and infection rates that were achieved before we had any kind of preventive therapy or treatment for TB. And certainly, as we see um, social and economic progress, we can expect that TB rates will decline. Um, but we do, have, we do have these tools right now. And while we wait and hope for improvements in, in social and economic conditions to complement them, I do think that we have opportunities to try to scale those up and accelerate that, that decline. Um, but as you point out, it's no small challenge to do in a country like India, which has a large number of TB cases, as well as individuals recently infected. Um, with TB, and we need to find kind of efficient and effective strategies to do so. Please. Good morning. Uh, first, to a uh, comment to Manasi that it's nice to meet you because I have got introduced to you through the internet. It's nice to meet you. And actually, you have given answers to us then, so you don't have to ask us questions. You have given us many answers for people who work in TB. Thank you. And a question to Dr. Jason. I come from Oman. I'm Dr. Mohan, who is working in Oman, in the Ministry of Health. We are a country who have 60% immigrant population who travels frequently to their own countries. So in this setting, how can we really address an, a preventive treatment regimen? Because we have a population which travels frequently to a high incidence setting. It's, it's a low prevalence country with a high prevalence population staying there. It's not like the migrant population of Europe or US. So there is an issue there in, in terms of addressing preventive treatment. This is what I feel. So in that context, I am putting a question whether the, the eager test quantification, how far the evidence is there to say that IGRA can be used to identify people who will progress to TB disease. Thank you. Okay. The audio isn't great up here, so I didn't catch the entire question, unfortunately. But um, I, I can answer the last question that you asked and then, and then try to answer the broader one. Um, you asked how good the IGRA test is in identifying individuals who are at risk for progression. Um, and it depends a bit on which population it's used in. Um, if it's used in young children, I think it actually performs much better because it identifies children with recent infection and they're at high risk of progression. 
Um, if it's used in household contacts, it may have a higher positive predictive value in identifying individuals who would benefit the most from preventive therapy. When it's used across the population, the positive predictive value, unfortunately, is really low, and you need to treat something like 75 to 100 individuals to prevent one case of TB. And so this is where we really need new tools that can be done, used in lower risk populations, but still pull out those that are highest risk for progression. I think that the gene expression signatures and some other um, emerging prognostics um, may be a solution for that, um, but we really are awaiting the data to be able to guide us. Okay, so I think I'm afraid we have to, to stop here. I just would like to thank the three speakers for their interesting and inspiring uh, presentations. I want to thank you all for your interest and, and attendance. I want to congratulate Amina again for the Union Prize. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the meetings and the sessions of today. Thank you. <laughs>